breaking news. Donovan Mitchell has been traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers for three players, including Lori Markkinen, Okag Baji, and a signing trade for Colin Sexton, in addition to three first-round picks and two pick swaps going back to the Jazz. In today's episode, we're going to look at what are the implications of this trade for both the Cleveland Cavaliers, the Utah Jazz, and I think more importantly, what does this say about the state of the league today? Uh, so let's jump right in. I, I think the the first one, the clearest one is, man, the, the Cavs really pushed their chips in the middle of the table, and they're kind of going all in a little bit. Um, they had a, a very good team last year, kind of surprised everybody with Garland making a big jump, Evan Mobley with an, a great rookie year, Jared Allen coming into his own. And now they cash in on some of those assets that they've accumulated, and you add in a a secondary playmaker, Donovan Mitchell, who they desperately needed. Um, you know, watching the Cavs last year, Darius Garland was really the the one, the engine that made that team go. And whenever he was, he sat, that team didn't really have a playmaker to, to run the, the unit to create plays for others. And not only that, but Garland was asked to do so much on a nightly basis that he would just, he would wear down. Um, when you ask one guy to do everything and be everything for your offense, it, it takes a toll. And, and now you add next to him, arguably a, a better offensive player, at least a better scorer than Garland. Garland's probably a better playmaker at this point in their careers. And those guys in a backcourt, I mean, that's a, a face value. That's a magnificent tandem to have in the backcourt. Now, I think there's going to be some questions about how are they going to fit together. Donovan, much of his time in Utah, especially the last few years, has been a very ball-dominant player and was best with the ball in his hands. So can he play off the ball a little bit, or is it going to have to be kind of a your turn, my turn type thing? I think that remains to be seen, but it does help a lot that Donovan Mitchell is a really, really good three-point shooter throughout his career. Shoots a high volume. I think he's 36 plus percent on those high volumes. He takes a lot of tough threes. So, I mean, I think from, from a fit standpoint, it might not be perfect, but those are two guys that are smart that'll figure it out. Um, and look, like it's kind of making this a, a great trade for the, the Cavs. Now, they did give up a lot. They gave up... Um, basically three first round picks, two swaps. And the, this first round picks, I believe, are completely unprotected. And then they also gave up this year's first round pick and Okai Ibaji, um, as well as uh, trading, signing trading Colin Sexton, who they probably weren't going to re-sign anyways. And Laurie Markkinen, who, while he was good last year for them, was got kind of a, a questionable fit um, on, the, on a team with Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. And now you look at a starting lineup that's got Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, and then you throw in Evan Mobley and Jared Allen and then pick pick a small forward to run with that lineup, and you've got the makings of a good offensive team, a really good defensive team. Um, now, I think there's going to be some question marks on the, the, the Cavs. You know, how good are they going to be in the backcourt defensively? Um, between Garland and, and, and Mitchell, you have two relatively undersized guards, and um, frankly, Mitchell has shown a penchant for not really caring about defense in, in recent years. Maybe it's just an effort thing. Uh, maybe, you know, being in, in new scenery and being with these younger guys is going to invigorate him and he's going to lock in a little bit more defensively. But Mitchell was not good at, at all in the math series around this year with the Jazz. And look, he, he was like a, a pra, pra, practically a turnstile in, on defense, letting Jalen Brunson just blow right by him time and time again. And so if that's the, the Donovan Mitchell we see on defense, there's going to be some problems. Um, but I like to think that he's going to walk in and that'll help. Um, also, having Evan Mobley and Jared Allen on the back line to cover is going to it's going to help tremendously. Now, Mitchell, of course, had Gobert who, uh, in, in Utah, one of the best defensive centers in the league, um, if not the, probably the best. But Having a Jared Allen and an Evan Mobley, Mobley can go guard the perimeter a little bit. I think that should help. Um, but that's going to be the biggest question mark for this team is, okay, can you get Donovan Mitchell to buy in on the defensive end? And if you can, this is going to be a really good defensive team, really good offensive team. I think arguably puts him up there in, in contention, maybe in the, the tier below the Celtics and the Bucks. But they've, they've got a proven playoff scorer, Donovan Mitchell, two guys that can get you a bucket anytime, anywhere, can create plays for others. And you have two great defensive players down low in Mobley and, and Allen. And who knows what the ceiling of uh, Mobley is going to be. I mean, he's great as a rookie, um, showed flashes on offense. He was great defensively, but he showed a lot of flashes on offense. I mean, this guy could just keep growing and growing. So 
looking at, I think the biggest takeaways, man, the Cavs finally have a team without LeBron. Um, you know, for the last 20 years, they were only good when LeBron was on their team and they were horrible without him. And finally, the, the Cavs have a team that can compete in the East sans LeBron. And I think that that's a huge step for the organization. It's great for the league um, to, to see this young team kind of pull through, come together, hit on some draft picks, and now bring in a star, uh, 25, 26-year-old Donovan Mitchell to help run the show. So, like, like the trade for the Cavs, it is very much an all-in move, but, like, all these guys are young. They'll grow together. I think it, all their stars are 25, 26, and under. That's four, I mentioned. Great setup for the future, and, look, I look like them to be a team to reckon with for, for years down the road in the East. On the flip side of this trade, the Jazz, um, they – go further into rebuild mode, just completely blowing up their team for last year as they add three picks, two swaps, three players, and their their draft pick accumulation just continues. They're, they're clearly a team, Danny Ainge is committed to let's add as many assets as we can and let's build for the future. I think it's interesting because the Jazz, if we go back two years, they were the number one seed in the NBA, I believe. And like they have had some unceremonious playoff exits, but to see a team with two stars at you know thirty years of age and are younger and, and Gobert and Mitchell just blow it up, it, it's an interesting take. Um, I clearly the Jazz didn't think that they could win a championship as currently constructed, and I think there was definitely some locker room issues um, the last year or two, uh, especially after after the COVID incident with Rudy Gobert. Uh, but you know it's it's another team that is going full tank mode. Um, all out of the Thunder, the, the Rockets did this for a little bit, set, going back to the 76ers to trust the process, the Spurs um, trading in all their, their assets to, or all their players to get assets. And so, I mean, I think you're going to see the Jazz completely bottom out this year. They are clearly trying to lose. It's the, the quintessential tank for Wimbiamba move. Um, and look, I think, I think it, what this trade really states it was more of an indictment of the NBA today. Um, the A has more and more become an all-in or nothing league. Either you're trying to go for it all and win today and push all your assets to the middle of the table to cash in for the star now, or you're trying to trade any asset you have, any star you have to get assets so you can build for the future and hopefully hit on that one transcendent player that you can win a championship with. And um, well, it's, it's, it's an interesting balance because, I mean, I think you have the haves and the haves nots. You have these teams trying to push to win it all and these teams that are just like, we're not going to win. We're going to try and lose as much as we can. And I don't know if that's necessarily great for the league. I think um, it's an indictment on the, the tanking problem the, the NBA has, uh, that something maybe needs to be done to alleviate tamping, uh, tanking a bit. I mean, you have the thunder of tank for multiple years, the Rockets, and uh, in recent memory, now the Jazz, the Spurs. Is that really what the league wants? Is these teams just trying to lose? Is that really what's best for the league? I, I don't know. I, I, I in, in a competitive league, having teams that are just literally trying not to win on a given night. Now, and I'm not saying the players aren't trying to win, but the organization is trying not to win. I don't think that's really what you're looking for if you're in the NBA. And I think... This is an indictment on, hey, maybe they need to look into changing the draft process where teams aren't rewarded so highly for, for tanking. And I know they did even out the draft odds a bit uh, where your maximum chance of getting the number one pick is only, I think, 14% now. Um, but but even so, it clearly these teams are so incentivized to tank. The best players come from um, tanking and getting these high picks in the draft. So it's it's an interesting conundrum. Um, it's in and then plus you see these teams trading their draft picks into the, the distant future. I mean, now it's several teams this summer have pushed all their first round picks to other teams, traded them in uh, in in recent memory. You have the Hawks who traded what three picks and a swap for Dejounte Murray. You had the the Timberwolves who traded what was it? I want to say it was like five picks and two pick swaps or something like that for Rudy Gobert. And now the Cavs throwing three unprotected picks and two pick swaps to the to the Jazz for Donovan Mitchell. It's it'll be interesting to see what are the repercussions. I mean, the last time um, 
or the, the one that always stands out to, to me at least is the, the Nets when they traded all of those picks many years ago for KG and Pierce, and that trade worked out horrifically for them. Um, their team fell, KG and Pierce aged didn't really do a whole lot in Brooklyn. And then all of a sudden those picks were really valuable and Boston's sitting on this treasure trove. So I don't know if this is necessarily a good thing for the league, but it, it really speaks to the kind of the all in or nothing uh, mantra that the entire NBA has kind of adopted to this point. Now, that being said, while you still do have the haves and have, have nots, I do think this makes the East hyper competitive. I mean, I look at it and there's probably nine teams that you would consider that, hey, these guys should all be in the playoffs. And I think the tiers are really, I think Celtics and Bucks are at the top of that list. I mean, I think those guys have the championship pedigree. Now, the Celtics didn't win it last year, but they were a really good team, one of the hottest teams in the league the second half of the season and just ran into a bus all in the Warriors in the finals. The Bucks, the uh, won the championship in, in 2021. And then if it weren't for Chris Milton injury, maybe win it again this year. I think those two teams are clearly the, the best. But I do think in the, in the second tier, this really vaults the Cavs up there in, in contention with the, the Nets, the 76ers, the Heat. Um, and now the Cavs are right there with them. Maybe they don't have the playoff experience of some of those teams or the, the superstars of some of those teams, but they have a lot of talent. And if it plays a cohesive unit, I think they can be right there up with those teams and uh, making a push. And a, and a run into the playoffs. And I think below that you have Hawks, Raptors, Bulls, teams with some good talent. They maybe can hit really high highs, but on a on a game-to-game basis, maybe aren't as consistent or as going to be as great as those other teams I mentioned. But I mean, that's really nine solid teams. And if you if you look forward to the playoffs next year, it's going to be quite the gauntlet for, for any team to make it out of the East. I mean, they're going to have to go through three really, really strong teams to make it to the finals. And I like that. From, from a competitive balance standpoint, I think that's great. I mean, I, for, for many years, we the East was LeBron's uh, conference and LeBron was going to come out uh, of the East. And he did that for, what, eight straight years. And so now to see that flipped a little bit, where while I do think this is Giannis's conference, there's some pretty heavy um, contenders up there to that'll make a push to, to, to win the East. And so... Look, from a competitive balance standpoint, I think that's really good. Um, but again, we're adding to the, the list of teams that are just tanking and tanking and tanking. And that, from a, from a product standpoint, is maybe not great for the league. But um, anyway, all in all, I think this is a really impactful trade. Um, it's It'll be interesting to see how Dominic Mitchell fits in. Uh, I guess kind of a lost storyline in, in this all is the Knicks, who were considered the front runners for months for Donovan Mitchell, somehow didn't pull off the trade for Mitchell. Um, is Donovan going to be a little disappointed not to go to New York? I'm not sure. New York versus Cleveland. Um, many would say that New York is a far better city. Um, Cleveland is, is a great city. It's a good basketball town, but it's not quite the flash of Madison Square Garden. So I'm interested to see somebody who's as star-centric as Donovan, who seems to love the media like Donovan Mitchell does. How is he going to fit in in Cleveland? I think that'll be an interesting storyline to watch. And then it'll be interesting to see what what are the Jazz going to do with all these picks? I mean, they have a treasure trove now. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But um, let me know Let me know y'all's thoughts on this trade. Um, I think it's pretty impactful for the NBA. We'll see how it unfolds uh, with the Cavs this year and into the near future. Um, feel free to like and subscribe if you would like. I would love for you guys to, to join the channel. Um, thanks for listening.